right. Well, thank you very much, Jack. And uh, uh, it is a, a bit of a challenging uh, topic and uh, it, a lot of new data that I think we all need to understand and discuss so we learn how to, to treat these important aspects of the disease. Now, it is uh, in the spa session, but I'm going to look a lot of the data from psoriatic arthritis because I think in terms of the clinical research studies, the presence of enthesitis and dactylitis has been covered a little bit better in the psoriatic arthritis studies than the axial spa or non radiographic axial spa studies. So here are my disclosures. So uh, where do we get to dactylitis and enthesitis? Well, it's one of the aspects of disease, and this fits with both spondyloarthritis and psoriatic arthritis being one of the spondyloarthritic conditions, and also the other domains of disease. And the answer is we don't know. We don't know how people in psoriatic arthritis, for example, you know that 80% of the people start with psoriasis. Something happens, there's some exposure that is then translated into alterations in genomics and metabolomics. Probably a lot of that uh, relates to epigenetic changes, as we've heard and we'll hear about later from Dr. Lou Bridges. Uh, influence of the microbiome. That gives us the signs and symptoms of a disease, which vary from person to person. You see dactylitis and enthesitis in the middle. Are they partial to any particular kinds of exposures? Well, they may be to physical force, which is, of course, very important for the, uh, the health of the antheses. And as we'll see, dactylitis, I would consider kind of within the spectrum of antheseal disease. Uh, so it's, it's part and parcel of uh, one of the aspects, one of the domains of disease. But truth be told, we don't know why some people will develop just axial symptoms, some will develop axial symptoms and enthesial symptoms, and then others will have other parts of the disease, including uveitis, which we'll hear about in the next lecture. What are we talking about? Entheses, it's from the word, the word, the Greek word enthesis, which is insertion, which is actually a great name for it. You think about all your tendons, all your ligaments, all your joint capsules inserted into bone everywhere across the body. Uh, we used to not pay much attention to them, did we? We kind of ignored tendons. Uh, when they ripped, we thought they were ripped and they would heal. Uh, we knew they went into bone, but they're really, as you see, very elegant structures where the, they have the task of transmitting an incredible amount of force in a short period of time from the muscles to make movement in the bone distal to that. So they are well aligned and they sort of slowly become, uh, in essence, uh, part of the bone. Uh, so it's a, it's a very elegant structure which does very well at its job, and that is transmitting force to allow a, a slow commotion. What about dactylitis? Dactylitis uh, is from the Greek word dactylos, which means finger. And for those of you with some gray hair, remember when uh, you had to study poetry. Remember when poetry actually rhymed? Uh, and we talk about dactylic hexameter. It was long, short, short with the, this, okay, that's going way off. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, anyway, it's dactylos, dact the uh, dactyl means finger. So dactylitis is, to me, and we can t uh, talk about it, the people have other ideas. I, to me, it's synovitis tendonitis, tenosynovitis, and enthesitis all in a single digit, which gives us the so-called sausage digit. And like I think like many of us, I've come to really hate that term because I, I think for every patient who walks in thinking they have a sausage digit, maybe one out of 100 actually has uh, enthesitis and dactylitis, and the rest are just sort of a weird fibro that thinks that their fingers are swollen that day or something. Um, we think of it with the spondyloarthritic conditions, certainly, uh, with axial spa, with psoriatic arthritis, but it occurs in other rheumatic diseases, in fact, gout. Uh, gout, where you have very brisk inflammation outside the joint, uh, the regions of the joint itself, can cause dactylitis. But so can a number of other conditions, including back in the day, infectious conditions, uh, less of that now. Other things like sickle cell disease can also give us this appearance of disease. So to me, dactylitis is enthesitis plus synovitis all in the same digit. How common is it? Well, let's look in psoriatic arthritis. Again, I think there are better data in psoriatic arthritis than in ankylosing spondylitis or axial spa. And as you see, the, the, this was a systematic review from a number of studies of extra, um, of various extra articulate and other domains in psoriatic arthritis, 65 studies. What they found is enthesitis pretty common. 
30% of the patients had anthocytis, 25% had dactylitis. So this is something we see all the time. I think their numbers were probably similar in SPA, although, as I said, there are fewer studies that address this. More common than, say, uveitis, which is important and we think about, but is not nearly as common, 3%. The same with inflammatory bowel disease. So anthocytis, dactylitis are common, and I think of them as kind of the missing piece of the complete approach to the patient. We can look at the skin. We've all gotten very good looking at skin psoriasis. Of course, we know how to look at perfluorarthritis. We or get a sense of inflammatory back pain. But I think anthocytis, because antheses are everywhere, uh, I, I think that explains some of the quality of life impact that anthocytis can have that it's difficult for us to measure in the clinic. Now, we did, it was mentioned the GRAPA recommendations. We'll come back to this at the end, but it calls out the individual areas of dactylitis and anthocytis, and I think this would be true in ankylosing spondylitis as well. What do we do to treat patients? Well, there may be some variability depending upon the different domains that are involved. We're going to focus on the middle, the anthocytis and dactylitis. This is a, a, a very nice presentation. Alexis Ogdi, we heard from yesterday, uh, put this together. And it shows kind of the complexity, again, in a psoriatic arthritis population. But if you look on the right, you see the, the symbols that show anthocytis, the knee down the bottom, and dactylitis in the foot. And then see, as people present, and this was in the corona registry, just regular doctors taking care of patients with spa and psoriatic arthritis, how often it happened. And we know it is 30%. And it's all, it's, it's a mixture. Sometimes it's anthocytis with peripheral arthritis. Sometimes it's just with skin. Sometimes it's with axial disease. So kind of a, 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 a complex uh, idea that rings true to us in the clinic. We see our patients, and they, they can have a variety of different involvement. And we're going to look at the data specifically for dactylitis and anthocytis. Well, bringing them into their own, if you will, was the idea that maybe there was something a little bit different going on with anthesial disease compared to, say, with skin disease or compared to, say, with peripheral arthritis. And that was the elegant work. This is a, a, an old review now, Rick Lorries and Ian McInnes, looking at uh, the potential role of IL-23. So IL-23 uh, receptor expressing T cells, present in the antheses, responding to IL-23, which is uh, elaborated presumably as part of the gut joint axis. That leads to the elaboration of IL-22, which gives us osteoblastic changes and the overgrowth that we just heard from Dr. Haroon. And also IL-17, with synergizing with TNF, gives us some of the damage. So in theses, uh, are an important aspect of the spa conditions, and now we're understanding more about the immunopathophysiology that underlies that. In the future, I think we may be able to tease that out even more. This was an elegant presentation from uh, ULAR, not last year, but the year before, looking at the expression of some potential biomarkers, so some of the inherent antimicrobial peptides in the skin, like beta defensin, some that we think of more associated with bowel inflammation, like uh, calprotectin, and looking that, at that we, across domains, and including measures of uh, the uh, uh, neutrophil chemotractant, IL-8, and C-reactive protein. And what you see is uh, a different pattern, depending upon the domains of disease that are most active in those patients. So I really like this. I think this is, of course, this is more hypothesis generating. This is not really proven as of yet, but I think in the future, maybe we will be looking at the different domains, not just from how we assess them in the clinic, but also perhaps with a more thorough understanding of the immunopathogenesis, and will that translate into more specific therapy? Well, one, uh, uh, you could spend a whole lecture, you could spend a whole program on uh, the idea of how do we assess anthocytis and dactylitis, which is super important, but we don't really have a, t a ton of time to be able to do that, but it's controversial. Of course, antheses insert into bone. Think of tendon insertions into bone. How do you find out if they're inflamed? You push on them. And if you push on them and they're tender, I think most of us would accept that that means that there's something going on there, and we would say that signals the, uh, the presence of anthocytis. 
tricky, isn't it? Because you think of enthesial sites like the insertion uh, about the mu muscles of the forearm where they give you tennis elbow. They're also largely overlapping places where patients with fibromyalgia are tender, which I think fits because we're more tender. If you push on your theses, you're going to be more tender than you are a few inches distal, for example. They're more tender. They're richly innervated with nerves, but we have no way to assess their involvement on physical exam other than pushing them and recording that they're tender. What about highly sensitive imaging? Well, of course, ultrasound is great for that. And ultrasound can find synovitis because you're looking at anatomic reference points and tendonitis. And uh, I've been involved in meetings with uh, ultrasonographers. They will argue for hours about what is the difference between tendonitis and enthesitis. Enthesitis being very close to the insertion into the bone. But that's where a lot of the pathophysiology is. If you think of those of you who do ultrasound, for example, for the rotator cuff, almost all the action is right at the insertion versus tendonitis that is more proximal. Uh, I'm not going to separate those, and I, and I think uh, we're still trying to figure out what the best answer is. There's a study ongoing now that uh, Leahy Eater in, at Toronto is putting together trying to look at the optimal use of ultrasound looking for anthocytis. There are publications that will say that uh, there's a big difference. And the question is, which is correct? So if you push on it and it's tender, and yet it doesn't show up with any ultrasound signal, you might say, well, that's fibromyalgia. That's just central sensitization. But what about if it's the other way? What if it's not tender? and you do an ultrasound and it lights up, and that happens. The correlation between physical exam and ultrasound findings um, is, is amazingly disparate. It's, it's not nearly as good as we would think. So we're still sort of wrestling with the optimal way to evaluate in theses, both for research studies and also even in the clinic. Tremendous advance was MRI. And here, a beautiful slide uh, that you see, even using an old MRI machine, showing a difference between rheumatoid arthritis on the right, where almost all the action is within the synovium, and uh, psoriatic arthritis, showing synovitis, but also very abundant enthesitis. And I think, how do we incorporate the sensitive imaging like MR into the evaluations. And it's gotten even more complicated because the techniques have gotten all the more better. So this is a high strength magnet, the three Tesla magnet, with what they call ultra short time echo recovery sequences. Basically, this, uh, to me, it's so sensitive, it blurs the line between uh, the kind of enthesial changes that you might see if you were in the gym this morning for a little bit too long and you, you were putting a little bit too much stress on your tendons versus those that are pathogenic and relate to uh, not strictly to force, but just because of the disease itself. Uh, so we're still wrestling with the optimal way to, to um, evaluate enthesitis and therefore by definition also dactylitis. I think a, a tremendous uh, evolution in a very short period of time in how we can consider in theses. And this is Georg Schett did a, a nice review of this, showing that what we have is presumably force, which then causes injury. And as part of the recovery of uh, the injury, you have inflammation. Of course, inflammation is part of the response to the body healing itself. Uh, we had kind of known about this for a very long time, but I think uh, we know much more about it now. And this is actually a side interest uh, from Professor McInnes, who's interested in lots of things across the board, as we heard from our great plenary talk this morning. But he has done, and the people in his group have done a lot of work looking at what happens, what mechanisms are involved in uh, tendinopathy. So if you injure a tendon, what happens to it? Uh, elegant work showing, uh, for example, the intricacies of the kind of type of collagen that's laid down. So if you rip a tendon that's type 2 collagen, it's very strong. It's a linear array that's able to transduce force very efficiently. When it repairs, it uses type 4 collagen, which is kind of like a patch, kind of like a scab that goes on the tendon. In the meantime, we have all the uh, a host of uh, inflammatory mediators 
inflammatory cytokines, other inflammatory proteins, non-protein inflammatory medias like the prostaglandins that are involved in the repair process. So this is a beneficial use of inflammation when it relates to repair, but almost certainly an exaggeration of this same process it would un is what underlies the pathogenic anthocytis and dactylitis that we see in our patients. What about in the clinic as we see patients looking at a psoriatic cohort, and this is from Dafta Gladman's group in Toronto. Interestingly, a lot of the people have just a couple of entheses. So as we saw, 30% had entheses in the overall uh, systematic analysis. That's what they found as well. A lot of them have one or two at each individual visit. And these can vary, of course. Somebody who comes in and at one time their Achilles tendon is tender to palpation. Next time they come, it may be one of the tendon insertions about the knee. So it can vary over time. Usually it's just a few. Even though it's just a few, they have an outsized effect on quality of life, as we'll come back to. How do we measure these? Well, we push on the tendon. If you push on the location and it's tender, I think we have to accept that as anthocytis. Certainly that's how we do it for clinical research studies. Which index do you use? And theses are literally everywhere. Uh, you could spend the entire day examining in theses. The old Maastricht one, I think, took a good part of the day because you're feeling sort of every vertebral level at the spinous process where there are important uh, tendon insertions. So the, uh, you see kind of at either end, the lead is very simple and it tends to work uh, pretty much as well as those with m greater numbers. The LEI and the SPARC tend to be more focused on peripheral entheses. The MASSES, a simplified version of the Maastricht, is more axial, more central entheses. Both can be important in individual patients, and I think that's, that's sort of a, a troubling aspect. We've had some difficulties when we go through our patient base to look for research questions related to anthocytis. I think most of us are not examining all of the antheses. I think we do what makes clinical sense. That is, somebody walks in and says, Doc, I got this pain in my chest wall. We examine it, and it could well be antheses or anthocytis in a person with the spondyloarthritis. We're not going to examine the whole breadth of other antheseal sites, so do we know if they're involved or not? As I say, it has, anthocytis has an oversized impact, if you will, on quality of life. And this was a study from the Netherlands that I think surprised some people. It looked at a bunch of early psoriatic arthritis patients who came in who um, had not had treatment yet. Prevalence of anthocytis in that same range. In this case, they had 40%. Fewer number of patients had dactylitis, but if you look at the spidergrams for quality of life, the point that they found is that anthocytis had a, more of an impact on impaired quality of life than, say, peripheral arthritis, which was very interesting. And I think anthocytis is kind of a sleeper and I think explains some of the outsized symptoms that sometimes our spa patients have. They just feel bad and they can't relate it as our rheumatoids can. I feel bad and both my wrists and both my knees are swollen and my knuckles. Uh, I think in, in spa we see some people who feel just as bad but it's, it's harder because it's more diffuse uh, and it's, it's hard to pin down I think because it represents enthesial involvement. Well, what about the treatment? So we'll spend the rest of the time going over the data for the treatment options for this. Adjunctive therapy is very important. In fact, one of the things that's been proven with data to help uh, enthesitis is uh, eccentric exercise, uh, and, and uh, some people would add in injections to that. We're not going to talk much about that. We'll talk about some of the other therapies and what's their effect specifically on enthesitis and dactylitis. Well, you heard uh, Eric Rudman talked about this yesterday. This was the SEAM study, methotrexate versus TNF inhibitor, in this case, etanercep versus the combination. We talked, he showed the data in terms of the peripheral arthritis and showed the skin. What about the, the uh, dactylitis with the LDI, the Leeds Dactylitis Index, and the anthocytis? In this case, they use the SPARC. Uh, and you see that the therapies seem to have an effect. Now, of course, one of the problems with the SEAM study, there's no placebo. So you can't really determine the effect size. 
But we know from other studies in which there was a placebo that the TNF inhibitors, including etanercept, have been effective for dactylitis and enthesitis. So this is interesting because it shows that methotrexate is not so far away from that. What about other therapies? Let's go over them, maybe a little bit of a historic time point, including up to the most recent data that we have. So this is a very old study. This was the IMPACT study, an investigator-initiated study that a few of us did starting in the late 90s. And um, as you see here, the, the uh, people with uh, very active skin, very active joints, uh, incredible difference in this case with the TNF and infliximab for the peripheral joints, for the uh, skin involvement. We actually also, and what for one of the very first studies that ever looked at this, we looked at anthocytis and we looked at dactylitis. And it's funny, thinking back, uh, it was really quaint way back in the day. Um, I think a lot of this was designed in hotel bars and a lot of the notes were taken on cocktail napkins. One of the questions that came up, how do you measure anthocytis? And you, you could argue all day. We went with something very simple, just the antheses about the foot, uh, the insertion of the uh, Achilles tendon into the calcaneus and the insertion of the plantar fascia on the other side of the calcaneus, four spots, the so-called four-spot test. It worked incredibly well. For dactylitis, we had a big philosophical argument, ended up saying that it was only dactylitis if the entire finger was swollen. So someone who had a gigantic sausage that went to the PIP and maybe a little bit distal, but didn't involve the DIP, that was not uh, dactylitis, kind of made that up. Uh, we also scored it, one, two, and three, because dactylitis is something that can be present and be very bad, like a three gross beyond the, the borders of the joints and the digit grossly swollen, one where it's clearly swollen, and two is in between. And that the trouble with something like that, of course, is how do you how do you get consistency among different evaluators or even the same evaluator over time with that? But you see an incredibly clear difference, and the, the dotted line is when the placebo switched over to active treatment. So this was the, really the start of, of adding measures of dactylitis and enthesitis into studies of new therapies. We've been doing it since, everybody's been doing it since, and we're still debating what's the optimal way of assessing them. But we have a lot of therapies available to us, some that attracted a lot of interest lately, the IL-23 and the IL-17 pathways. This is an interesting study. Uh, this also was Georg Schett's group, and it was focused on anthocytis. And because it was focused on anthocytis, patients actually had a little bit more in, in theocyl involvement than in some of the other studies where we record and assess anthocytis, but some people don't have it. 30% have it. Everybody had it here. And looking at the SPARC, the Masseys, and the Leeds anthesial index, they looked at TNF inhibitors and took the, all the TNF inhibitors the patients were on. This is a, a clinic sampling in uh, Erlangen, and they found that uh, Eustachinumab worked. Maybe Eustachinumab would even worked a little bit better for enthesitis compared to the TNF inhibitors. Now, you can't, it is a head to head, but it's not really a study, it, meaning it wasn't randomized. They just allowed whatever TNF inhibitor to be there. But I think the point would be that 1223 inhibition seems to be effective for anthocytis. What about the 17 inhibitors? Well, here's data with secukinumab from the future study, TNF naive patients, TNF exposed patients, but call your attention to resolution of dactylitis. So this is one of the other methods that we've seen to report. Take anybody who had dactylitis at the start of the study and then record those who have none at the primary endpoint of the study here at week 24, and then you see the open label extension, which the, the placebo drops out, but a very clear effect on dactylitis and in anthocytis. So the IL-17 inhibitors among the domains, dactylitis and anthocytis, definitely covered. Looked at in another head-to-head -head study. You heard about this study. You know this study. You've seen the results published for this. This was the Spirit head-to-head -head study, which I think was interesting, particularly because uh, earlier Spirit studies, uh, in an earlier Spirit, uh, the Spirit P1 study, the data on enthesitis were maybe didn't look quite as robust on first look as some of the other agents. And that caused a lot of debate because the way we, I don't think anybody is entirely satisfied with how we're measuring anthocytis. You could argue which index, you could argue, do you wait for resolution? But this study, proper head-to-head -head study, powered for the 
uh, endpoint, as you heard yesterday, of peripheral arthritis, ACR50 plus uh, uh, PASI 90. Um, but here, if you look at the other indices, look at the SPARC, where people who have enthesitis at the start must come to zero on the SPARC, and the LDI, the, uh, the lead stactylitis index, those who have it at the start having to go to zero. And it worked, and actually it, didn't, it seemed to work really comparably to the TNF inhibitor, in this case the TNF inhibitor being adalimumab. What about the uh, P19, the IL-23 inhibitor, gazelkimab? Of course, we're getting more familiar with that in psoriatic arthritis. Our colleagues in psoriasis have had it for a while. There you see the ACR20 responses with the different doses. But if you look here, the resolution of dactylitis, so a dactylitis score of zero, a Leeds anthocytis index score of zero, uh, it can be effective. So we can compare head to head across studies, certainly not with a evaluation outcome such as those used for anthocytis where there may be some wobble, but I think you can clearly see that there is a statistically significant effect with IL-23 inhibition uh, on dactylitis and on anthocytis. So where, where do we fit in with this? I, this, I show this, the different, uh, not domains of disease per se, but axial involvement in ankylosing spondylitis, bowel involvement in Crohn's and IBD, skin psoriasis and peripheral arthritis and PSA. Are there differences between what we ever see in dactylitis and enthesitis compared to what you see with peripheral arthritis? Not usually. Usually they track pretty well. Um, one area which I thought was maybe a, uh, interesting and said maybe there could be a difference, and that was an analysis of a premolast. So this is, a, 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 I like this analysis because it looked at people who were ACR20 non-responders, but they're still in the study. This looks at two years. They're uh, patients in a premolast study, now in open-label extension, but they're not ACR20 responders. Now they could be ACR19 responders with 19% improvement in the tender and swollen joint count and the others could be better, but still they're non-ACR20 responders. And what happened? Well, you do see a lot of improvement in anthocytis and dactylitis. It's interesting, it's not universal, so the pain response was, was not notable at all for these people who are ACR20 non-responders, nor the hack. Um, nor the global assessment, but enthesitis and dactylitis actually could improve even in people who had perhaps less robust improvement in their peripheral arthritis. And what about the jackinibs? Um, jackinibs, we've heard a lot about the different domains. Uh, uh, peripheral arthritis, they seem to work. Skin disease is a different agent to agent. What about anthocytis and dactylitis? Well, here's data with tofacitinib, and this is from the old Opal Broaden study, uh, and this looks at uh, refractory. Uh, this is a, a DMARD refractory population. Anthocytis on the top, and especially draw your attention to the placebo con controlled phase and dactylitis on the bottom, so you do see efficacy. Eupatacitinib, there's the peripheral joint responses, the skin responses underneath that. Resolution, again, uh, the outcome chosen was resolution of enthesitis and resolution of dactylitis. And here you see st statistically significant differences, which if you look compared to the TNF inhibitor, looks like it's comparable responses in these domains. So I think very, very interesting. And of course, as we said, I think this is very important. And then the, the newest one that we're talking about, the Ducravacitinib, a TIC2 inhibitor. And you say, is that more suited to, because of the involvement in uh, IL-23? Is this a better way to approach dactylitis and enthesitis and skin disease? Well, we don't know. We need head-to-head uh, -head studies to compare. But here, if you look at the, the um, Leeds uh, anthocytis index, you see that you do get a significant response with the Ducravacitin, the, the TIC2 inhibitor, Jackinib. So how do we fold anthocytis and dactylitis in? Well, isn't that interesting? Here are the different indices in psoriatic arthritis. As important as I think anthocytis and dactylitis are, only enthesitis is included in those people looking at MDA. You hear the DAPSA, which measures peripheral arthritis. It doesn't even make it in there. It makes it in some more the other composite, like the PASDAS, but I think this in part reflects some of our discomfort with knowing how best to measure these indices.
And then how do they fit into the treatment algorithms? Well, it gets barely a mention. Uh, anthocytis is in phase three here in the top of the purple. You see that the anthocytis may take your arrow over there. And the GRAPA guidelines, which we're going to have to redo because none of the, very little or, or not a bunch of the information that we just showed you is there, but we will redo these um, and include the latest data. And I think these are important domains of disease. So hopefully what I've shown is uh, kind of a background of anthocytis, stactylitis, a sort of quick history of how we got to where we are, which is, I think, tremendous progress in just a short period of time. Very exciting data with how people are, can respond in these important domains and also a lot of promise for the future. So thank you very much.